so hi everyone. Um, contrary to what might seem perhaps um, the most normal approach to, to astrobiology, in my project, I've studied Earth without life. And also I've tried to think about how it might help us um, actually understanding how life ends up changing a world over millions of years. My name is Rafael Rienz Silva. My mentor is Dr. James Cleaves. And here's my presentation. So I'll, I'll start by talking about biosignatures as it has been discussed in this, uh, in this conference already. Um, there are several biosignatures that we know already, at least from our solar system, both methane on Mars, phosphine on Venus, which are all out of place gases that we really would not expect to find them. But at the same time, they're at a very low concentration. And if they indeed represent signs of life, it would be microbial, very primitive sorts of life. Now, I want you to think about a planetary wide biosphere. And just like the one that we have on Earth for millions of years, and to think about the kind of changes that such a biosphere could induce on a planet, for instance, in its geochemical cycles and in pretty much every aspect of the planet. Um, now, to think about this and how life as in, in such a wide biosphere as the one we have on Earth, um, it, it, and to ask what would be the Earth like if instead there, was, uh, there had not been such a wide biosphere on this planet, for instance, regarding its geochemical cycles, it's pretty much the same as asking, well, how does life affect a planet over billions of years? And that's the kind of uh, question that I wanted to answer in this um, presentation, at, at least in the kind of research that I've been doing this summer. Now, to try to picture a lifeless Earth, um, one needs to build models, and, unless if we want to sterilize the whole planet. Um, so building a model uh, require, requires us to have some previous assumptions about um, what we want to, to study. And in this case, this has actually been done already by our mentor, Dr. James Cleaves, by, um, by trying to study how the geochemical cycling of nitrogen would, be, would work like in a systems model of a Earth without the presence of life. Now, this has already been done. It has provided pretty interesting results, those simulations that have been conducted. So um, we would like to try to explain, expand that uh, by trying to model how phosphorus, which is another um, bio relevant, biologically relevant uh, element, element uh, chemical element, would be affected if uh, there was no life cycling on the planet while this cycle was going on. So uh, phosphorus is, uh, although it's it's pretty similar to nitrogen, it had some also have some pretty stark differences. For instance, on Earth it doesn't really appear as a gas, mostly as a solid or an aqueous state, and mostly actually in a, only a certain redoxed uh, oxidized forms, such such as the one that is present in the apatite minerals or in the phosphate uh, ions when dissolved in water. So what we tried to do was to build a model in which this uh, oxidized phosphorus is present and is um, divided. Uh, it has its total mass divided by its several reservoirs, which we have here, the atmosphere, the oceans, the oceanic crust, the continental crust, and also uh, two subdivisions of the mantle, an upper and a lower one. Now, we have assigned initial uh, masses to a uh, random initial masses for several simulations to these reservoirs, and we wanted to see how based on several processes that bring and, um, and redirect and redistribute uh, phosphorus throughout these reservoirs, how they over billions of years would evolve. Now, some of the processes um, we have uh, included are for instance, convection in the mantle, which can be parameterized very, in a very simple way, but also hotspot volcanism, which brings material, including phosphorus from the lower mantle to the upper crust. We also have some sorts of molcanism, which are more related to the upper mantle, which also bring up phosphorus. But then again, we also have to close the cycle. And that is done by, for instance, subduction, which brings the phosphorus that is present in the oceanic crust back to the upper mantle. A small fraction of that phosphorus, however, gets accreted uh, by, and that helps uh, create more continental crust. And of course, once we have continental crust on a planet, regardless of the existence of life, we will start having erosion, both wind erosion, which will, might bring some of dust particles that get that some of them might include phosphorus to the atmosphere, 
and also river iron erosion that brings um, a lot of phosphorus back into the oceans. Now, the atmosphere doesn't really have that much of a capacity to, to hold on with too large amounts of dust. So most of it gets uh, rained out into the oceans. And of course, the oceans also might have a maximum capacity for um, dissolved phosphorus. So there will also occur some precipitation and some net um, removal of phosphorus from the ocean due to hydrothermal processes in the bottom of the ocean. Now, we've also considered uh, the delivery of cometary phosphorus, which we know has, has had a play, um, a very important role in the, in the beginning of the planet's history. And, and of course, some of these processes are, are very well parameterized and uh, there's not much discussion that to be made about them, but some others, uh, for instance, the, these, these three that are here, uh, they decay exponentially as time goes on uh, on the planet, but of course, some others aren't really clearly defined on how they evolve over geological time. So we uh, try to simulate them in several planetary settings, several kinds of functional dependencies over time, and to see how they affect the end result uh, of the, the phosphorus. Now, uh, we know that uh, we, this is still uh, an ongoing research, but I, I already have some results to show you. Now, this is one of the, the plots that we get uh, which shows uh, the mass in each of the reservoirs uh, over geological time. As you can see in the beginning, there was a very large array due to, in, due to the, the several simulations having a, a random distribution of phosphorus in the initial conditions. But then, as you can see, the models that we have conducted relatively faster in geological history tend to uh, a convergence. And this convergence leads to an equilibrium value, more or less equilibrium value that we can compare at the present time, for instance, of the Earth after the beginning of the simulation to the ones that we have on as dashed lines that are the present day value of an Earth that has life. And by chain and by comparing these differences, whether they are get to to get pretty similar values or whether they're completely different, we might get to learn some important things about how life changes this geochemical cycle. Now, if you look at the oceans, as you can see here in the bottom and the oceans and the atmosphere, um, they have, um, they are all, um, they don't seem to vary much over time, but in fact, they have uh, reached in, at least in this simulation, a sort of um, dynamic equilibrium, which uh, never is never able to exceed a certain level, which is the, um, the saturation level of both the oceans and the atmosphere. Uh, and the fact that there is a convergence in the other reservoirs, it's also very good. For, it means that the model is self-consistent. Now, if I, show, if I zoom in in both the continental crust and the oceanic crust part and on the mantle, we see, for instance, in the mantle that there is a, although we didn't really constrain very much the possible array of values, so we could have something to varying orders of magnitude, but still, both the upper mantle and the lower mantle, as you can see, reached equilibrium points that are very close to the present day estimates on Earth uh, to the values that uh, they got. So this means that by starting with a, an initial, a similar initial amount of phosphorus on Earth, such a, a lifeless planet still gets to a, the pretty similar distribution of mass within the mantle. And it makes sense since life doesn't appear to Mean to change a lot of what's happening in the mantle. But if you look at the surface, the crust pr pr primarily, uh, as you can see, there's um, there's a, a big a bit a big difference between what we have on the present day Earth and what the simulation suggested. So we still don't know if this is true or if this is uh, a valid result out of our simulation. But if this holds true, then the continental crust and the oceanic crust completely switch roles, so to say, and they. And apparently, uh, the oceanic crust gets more uh, material than it would on a live, living planet, while the continental crust get, is eroded away much quick, much quickly. Now, this um, could be, if the model is correct, of course, one possible interpretation is that life finds a way of um, keeping the, um, the phosphorus or other um, biologically relevant materials where, in places where they are bioavailable. Um, 
which is, for instance, not the case of the oceanic crust for many of them. But that, as, you, as I said, there's still a lot, a lot of research to do. Uh, we would like, for instance, to study how, as I mentioned, several, parameter, several parameters or several functional dependencies uh, vary um, and cause the equilibrium values to which the system tends towards to change. Uh, and of course, once we have that more or less constrained, we would also like to add a reduced phosphorus uh, cycling, which runs parallelly to this one and might have some points in, con in, con uh, in contact to it, uh, not, which is not very relevant for us uh, since we don't really have much reduced phosphorus around here, but for a, a, another planetary setting, it would be interesting. And once we have a reduced and oxidized a model for phosphorus, we could pretty much with little effort switch it into a sulfur cycling model, which is also very relevant as we know that sulfur is a, um, an element that is very, very widely used by life as we know it. And of course, once we have it done, why not explore different planetary settings? What about a, notion, a planet in which the ocean vanishes away over time, for instance, like Mars, or by contrast, a world that's just oceans, an ocean world, or for instance, an icy moon. There's a countless possibilities that we would love to study, and we will keep on studying this uh, because the, the research is very far from over. Um, but it's still very exciting to see how um, planetary, um, um, it's such a planetary system or such a planetary geochemical cycle might actually have uh, depend a lot on how life, whether it exists or not on a planet. And based on that, we might even get to find new kinds of biosignatures that may. Uh, Signalize to us the, the existence of life on that planet. So that's all. Thank you all very much for listening. Awesome. Great talk, Raphael. Are there any questions from our audience for the chat, or would anyone like to unmute and ask a question directly? Sanjay's hand comes up again. I love it. Sanjay, please ask a question. Raphael, thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. Uh, my question has to do more with the methods. So, did you build your own box model? Yes. And uh, the uh, initial conditions for box models, as you know, obviously, are the initial reservoir size as well as estimates of rates between all the boxes. Yeah. yeah. How did you quantify these for the phosphorus cycle? Well, um, now now we built our own model that it was very similar to the one that was already existent for uh, nitrogen, but we tweaked it into um, what uh, to the phosphorus uh, constraints. But we also, but for initial conditions, we simply assigned random values, uh, random distributions of masses of phosphorus out of a fixed total mass of phosphorus for the whole planet. We divided it into um, several uh, original um, distributions of mass for several reservoirs and just allowed it to run over time. So the things that were fixed were more, ge rel more related to the processes itself than to the initial masses. And what we wanted to do is to see if they would end up converging towards an equilibrium and what would that equilibrium value be like?